Good afternoon. Welcome back. Um, so our next speaker is Jim Davies. He is the Chief Technology Officer at uh, Genomics England. So another uh, speaker who is kind enough to make the long trip uh, across the pond. And uh, they are also new to, uh, to LabKey in the last year, um, I believe. Yeah, well, Genomics England, new to LabKey, yes. Um, so, <laughs> welcome to you, and uh, look forward to your presentation. Which will be somewhat less abrupt than that. Thank you. Uh, so, Genomics England is, is new to LabKey. Uh, nobody in this room is new to LabKey now, following those, those quite excellent talks earlier. Uh, so, I won't, <laughs> just casting my eyes slightly sideways at Michael for a moment, I won't feel the need to extol all of its virtues, partly because... We are new to it. We've started using it. And at my core, I'm still an academic. Worse than that, I'm a computer science academic. <laughs> and the thing in academia is that you do stuff, and then you talk about it. You do stuff until it's good enough. You make something work. Quite often, people carry on beyond the point where it's good enough. And Yes, you can't see it until it's finished. But this, you know, we, when we stand up and talk, it's usually to report results. Now, at this point, you, you know, you think, well, we just don't know what results are they going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about partly our experience to date, but more about the context in which we're going to apply the technology. And our reasons for choosing it should be fairly evident from the talks that you've already seen. I, I might bring up one or two more. We're not entirely new to LabKey because we've actually, we were introduced to it at Oxford, so I have another hat, which is that I'm Professor of Software Engineering at the University of Oxford. And we'd found, we, should I say, stumbled across it, partly, partly through a, a recommendation um, from a colleague who uh, worked at Microsoft and just you should check this out, um, partly because we've always been interested um, in what goes on at the Fred Hutch. And you know, we found it, we found it very useful. And this is how it came to the attention of Genomics England. We were already using it. So, but here today, I've got my Genomics England hat on. I'm Chief Technology Officer of this company. I'm going to tell you what it's doing, what it's there for, and we're going to come to some of the challenges that, that we're facing in this 100,000 Genomes project. Genomics England is the company that's been created by the Department of Health, the UK Department of Health, to deliver this project. It wasn't simply delivered by the department or any of the other existing government bodies. It was felt that it would be useful and sensible to actually give the responsibility of doing this to it. It's a company, but it, it's wholly owned by the Secretary of State for Health. We're not a commercial venture. We're merely a very focused government-owned organization that has one job to do, make this happen, this 100,000 Genomes Project. And if you were going to start off a strategic public initiative Putting a number in the name of the project is probably asking for trouble. <laughs> because if you were, you know, I'm sure politics is all about consensus, but if you were an opposition party and you wanted to point at a project and ask whether it had succeeded or not, then you've immediately got a metric there. You've got an indicator. So how many of you done then? It's a very, very good and pointy question to ask. <laughs> now, so I'll start with... Well, not really the, the, the politics, but a bit more of the background. And you'll find out why I started talking about academia in a moment. It'll all come together, I promise you. So this is a project that was announced by the Prime Minister David Cameron back in 2012. Now, you can see it as an Olympic legacy. It's part of, you know, what do we do next? Part of the focus for the Olympics for those, how many people in the room watched the Olympic opening ceremony? I know you probably found it. I believe that the United States was the only country not to show it live. <laughs> but um, there was a key feature of it that attracted some comment was, uh, you know, that there were, I, 
You know, I, if you haven't seen it, I'm quite sure it's there on YouTube, and I, I would recommend it to you. Um, beautifully put together in terms of, you know, what makes Britain great. One of the one of the things that you've got through the Industrial Revolution and the Spice Girls and other stuff <laughs> came the National Health Service. And this is something that you know people outside the UK sometimes find this a bit puzzling. Um, but British people are really incredibly proud of the NHS. They, they're, you know, they're sometimes rude about it, they sometimes complain, but then again, you know, we complain about a lot of things. It's very close to our hearts, and there are some lovely moments where NHS employees from Great Ormond Street Hospital are pushing beds around in a choreographed style with you know, um, Voldemort appears and is vanquished. It's beautifully done. You know, and we, we, we care. And David Cameron's a prime minister now. Some people have said, you know, that they, they, they have some doubts about this. But my impression, and I, I don't think of myself as slow or easily fooled, is that that man there actually cares about it. Really cares about the NHS. Now, this was announced as a project by the NHS for the NHS, but the NHS, of course, doesn't do all of the cutting edge genomic research. And to some extent, the, one of the goals of the project, and I'll come to those in a moment, is to build the capability, build the capacity for genomic medicine in our national health service, all the benefits that will bring, turning the whole of medicine upside down if you listen to some commentators. The NHS doesn't have that. The whole point of the transformation is to build it, to increase it. So the NHS wasn't going to be able to do this alone. So you had to put together a coalition of the willing, the experts. It, this is, requires all sorts of ingredients to make it work. And David Cameron's been driving this together with Jeremy Hunt, our Secretary of State for Health, who announced this at the, was the anniversary of the NHS when this was announced. It's very much tied to our National Health Service and what we want it to become in the future and how we want to sustain it. Now, you can, setting the politics aside, and I think we can because, you know, again, I, I don't think I'm easily fooled. And I've, I've been told by a number of people in Whitehall, uh, I don't know what the equivalent of Whitehall is in the States. Washington, I guess. Um, that this actually does have broad cross-party support. So it's not, it's not a political football. It's not a political um, initiative. It's something that is for the benefit of the NHS, for the benefit of patients, for the, for the benefit also of the UK taxpayer. I'll come to that in a moment. Now, of course, with all of that comes a little more visibility than you might choose to have while delivering a major transformational R&D project. You might prefer to go back into a, an, into a small academic environment and say, look, we'll just work on this, and we'll compute away, and we'll, we'll announce it when it's done. It'll be great. But rather like other initiatives at this scale, you can't do that because you're not going to achieve it in isolation, and you're not going to achieve it by stealth. This is something where you have to navigate the politics. And we have the top level support. And we have to pay the price that comes with that. Now, watch me activate this. The focus for the project is on rare disease and cancer. Now, I didn't know much about rare diseases before I got involved in this. Uh, for a start, they sound rare. So you might think, well, it's not really going to affect many people, is it? But it turns out that rare inherited disorders do affect uh, a large percentage of the population. Even if the incidence for each disease is less than 5 in 10,000, if you've got 7,000 plus disorders that have been identified, that starts to add up. What's more, though, it's actually very expensive. If you have a sick child 
and you can't get a diagnosis for that child, and there isn't an effective treatment, what happens? Well, you're going to go, and I talked to some of the parents, they're going to go from clinic to clinic to clinic. Um, it's not just you know, the impact in terms of, well, that takes up time from NHS professionals. It's also the impact on the economy. Um, one mother I was lucky enough to meet said that she'd had to give up her job because you simply could not undertake that appointments and the travel involved, seeing these specialists, and hold down the job that she had. It's not, you know, the economic impact of rare diseases is more than one might expect from their name, the name of this category of disease. Uh, also, um, my bioinformatician friends tell me that looking at rare inherited disorders is a very good way to understand our genomes, particularly if you are able to get a trio of participants, because you understand more about, you can rule out whole regions of the genome in terms of what may be affecting the um, development of the individual who is suffering. Now, our disorders thus far, and um, 7,000 diseases. Now, those of you who are thinking ahead to the computer science and the informatics are thinking, oh, they're all different, perhaps. Uh, that could mean that your data set or data model is going to get a bit complicated, isn't it? It'd be much nicer if you're just focusing on one disease and you could work out what the two or three key data points might be. And everybody could agree upon that. The disorders that we're looking at so far include, they're, they're dropped into these areas. We have 134, I think, live in terms of data collection and the model set for them. But there are cardiovascular disorders. There are hematological disorders, malignancies, inherited cancer, musculoskeletal, also neurological disorders, such as epilepsy and cerebral palsy. So there's rare combinations of these. Um, we're going to be sequencing samples from 50,000 participants. So that's around 16,000 affected probands on average, plus two affected or unaffected relatives. Now, the other, um, well, first off, uh, the technical note. I'm not a bioinformatician, and I don't pretend to be one. Some days, looking at the way that industry is exploding, I kind of wish I was. But there I am. I do data. I do computer science. I do software engineering. Any of you young enough and fresh enough to feel a bit of discipline hoppings in order? Yeah. Bioinformatics, yeah. You don't need me to tell you in Seattle that it's really taking off. We're sequencing using Illumina technology. For those of you who are bioinformaticians or would like to be bioinformaticians, we're looking at a coverage, a mean coverage, across the whole genome sequence of about 30x. That means each bit is, we've got on average, 30 reads considering each part of the genome. The bit that is more exciting for me, or that I've got more of a handle on, is, well, what do you do about the phenotype? Now, there's some very famous quotes from luminaries in this area saying that the genome is absolutely, I think Craig Ventner was most recently said this, absolutely no use to you without information about the phenotype, that the health of the individual, what you would like to know is what's wrong with them, what seems to be going on, what are their exposures, what diagnoses are there, what treatment, what were the outcomes? Tell me something about how this change at the genetic level may have produced many levels up. There's so much noise as you go up these different levels of abstraction. What does that mean for the participant? Now, in rare diseases, quite often you're not looking at straightforward clinical records, but you want a description of the disorder. So, and you, and you want that description to be comparable, collected in a comparable fashion. So you can say, well, are we talking about the same sort of thing for this, this person whose sample we've got here? And so we're using the human phenotype ontology, it's pretty nicely done, which addresses descriptions of these disorders. We capture it. Um, this is a, a web form where you can choose one of the ontological terms. There are 
modifiers that's certainly present, but there may be other things that you need to do in terms of modification. You might need to say something about the age of onset or laterality if it's something that could turn up on one side of the body or another. Cancer, cancer's more clinical for us. Now, we started with five cancers, ovarian, breast, colorectal, prostate, and lung, based on a combination of scientific and economic considerations. These are cancers that have um, a high, you know, certainly personal impact for sufferers, but also economic impact. The outcomes are not great um, for diseases like ovarian cancer. And the prevalence is quite high for some of these diseases when you go down. So there's a cost to the National Health Service. That's one consideration. But it's also where do you think whole genome sequencing might make a difference? And it's making a different kind of difference for cancer. In rare diseases, you might well get a new diagnosis. You might say, hey, we've, there's something going on. There's a pathway we've identified. There's something going on. We can give you some explanation on what's wrong with your child or what's wrong with you if it's an adult disorder. Cancer, in the short term, those of you who, who've been you know, studying cancer research and bioinformatics will understand that getting a whole genome sequence from somebody at this point probably isn't going to make a huge difference to their care. It might make a difference to people who have that cancer in the future, but here it's less likely to have an immediate impact. That said, one of the first patients to be sequenced, actually it changed their treatment because it turned out that they had a mutation that would indicate quite a different pathway involved. Most importantly, and um, you know, without being, being negative about, about the current state of the art in cancer, there are a whole bunch of drugs that they would have been given that wouldn't have made them very well at all. And actually, you know, on the basis of the genomic evidence, seems likely wouldn't have improved their situation. So that's very good in terms of quality of life. Um, there's, a, there's a little video you can find on the web. I'll talk about the web uh, footprint of Genomics England in a moment. 25,000 participants in cancer, so we get 50,000 samples because on average we'll be taking one germline, one somatic. I'm not saying blood and tumor because, of course, of the leukemias or blood cancers where we'll be looking for the germline sample from saliva or some other source. Uh, the Coverage there is slightly higher because of the nature of cancer being a disease of disordered genomes. And now my part. What are we doing about the phenotype? Well, we want to do this at scale. and We have a transformation agenda for our health service. So what we'd like is to set our data set, at least the core of it for data collection, to be synonymous, identical, or at least overlapping to a great extent with the set of data points that you ought to be capturing routinely for any patient with that cancer. So this ought to be, if we're moving towards genomic medicine, if we want high quality cancer care, your clinical data set, it's not that different from what we want for our research purposes. Now, I, I should add that, you know, an approach to our informatics architecture and the design of the program and the protocol that's gone through ethics is that we can go back and ask new questions. We can zoom in. Our, our core data set that we collect on every single participant with that disorder um, or with that cancer is one thing, but we also have consent to go back and say, particularly in rare disease, it, you know, this is science. It's, it's a, we're making scientific progress. It might be that for people with this disorder, suddenly we want to know, is there also hearing loss? We didn't think to ask that before, but turns out that it's a relevant question. So the program is, is not a, it's not a one-way street. It's not a flow of data from the NHS to a bunch of researchers who go and work on it. It's a dialogue between the clinical context and the researchers. So and, you know, I won't go on too much about translational medicine that's important. So I mean, people have found it difficult to define this or even to make um, you know, much progress in some ways in terms of translational medicine as a discipline. But it's incredibly important. It's probably the only way we'll get the numbers, the scale, the detail, the engagement, relies intimately on the, on the supporting informatics. 
for translation. You're talking, in a sense, about translating between languages, translating between contexts. And you need tools to do that at scale. Translational informatics, very important. And here, um, this program is an example of uh, how they're going, these ideas are going to be used. Now, the expectations of the program, yes, there are new diagnoses. There's patient benefit. Some, some people will participate in the program, and they will derive benefit for, for themselves or for family members. It, it, you know, carrier status can be important to some of these individuals. People who've had um, uh, problematic, um, trying to find the right words, a disabled child, if you like, they might, they might be having another child. They might want to know, well, I don't know what to do about this. Looking at the genome can, can make a big difference there. It's very difficult. It's a very sensitive area. If you've got um, cancer patients, maybe, maybe not, as I said earlier. But in the future, one hopes. Now, that comes from the scientific discovery box below that on the slide. Of course, this is about pushing the science forward. But not... Not at the expense of, of benefit to the patients and the development of NHS infrastructure. We want to do all of these things at the same time. Now, what you've got, you, don't, you want a data flow, you want a dialogue, you want a conversation between these two contexts, but you want to develop the infrastructure. This is costing the UK government £300 million to start with. Uh, it's in the nature of initiatives, public sector initiatives, that they quite often end up slight, costing slightly more than you hoped at the beginning. Now, our government's not, you know, not naive. It's not expecting to get all of that money back. But it would rather not, to do the next 100,000 genomes or the next initiative, have to spend it all over again. We want to leave a lasting legacy. And part of that is in the infrastructure that we build in the NHS. There's also a remit for economic growth, developing this infrastructure, making the science happen in the UK, might make UK, will push forward the development, the, accelerate the development of the UK life sciences industry. This is connected to other initiatives like UK Biobank. Will the UK be a great go-to place for life sciences research? This is pretty important. Now, I, I, there was a report that came out that, that said, Phew, you know, um, Genomics England and their techno-capitalism. No, did I say that? I got it wrong. I'll try it again. Genomics England and their techno-nationalism. We get accused of all sorts of things. And, I, you know, I appreciate we are saying we're not simply giving this data out to the world. There's very good reasons not to be doing that, actually. I don't think it's, it's a dangerous notion of nationalism to say, actually, we kind of want some... You know, we, we hope we're doing the right thing. We're developing stuff for, for the benefit of, of NHS patients. We're pushing science forward. You know, if we manage to do this in a sustainable way, we, we, you know, there's some benefit, some economic benefit, then we can carry on. You know, somebody has to pay the bills. Somebody has to fund the next stage. So um, I kind of reject that charge, actually, uh, of techno-nationalism. Now, the, the infrastructure that we're looking at, yeah. now you can find this as a person who's just undertaken a long transatlantic journey. Yes, OK. <laughs> National Health Service. Now, I, I'll just give you the schematic. You've got identified data. Because we're not just taking a one-off data extract. We're taking repeated um, messages, reports, uploads, files from the clinical context. Of course, we've got to be able to link all those together. So we need to keep the patient identifiers. We'll also be pulling in data from secondary sources, um, because there's a lot of clinical audits, national reporting data sets, particularly for cancer, that we can bring in. We've got the patient identities. Of course, the researchers don't need to know whose genome that is, and they don't need to know the address. Now, there's a bunch of research that you could do about geographical factors and so on. This may not be the program you need to do it in, in fact. There are larger cohort studies in the UK where you might look at effects like that. So 
To the first approximation, our researchers don't need name, address, telephone number, NHS number. So what we pass into the research environment is a de-identified version of that data. It hasn't been cleaned that much. I mean, dupl duplicates will have been removed. So if we, if we had a case report form mentioned earlier, or a report, or a pathology report, something uploaded from a clinic that had incomplete data, or, somebody want, or erroneous information even, somebody wants to correct that, of course we'll reconcile that to some extent. But really, you know, we, what we pass into the research environment is the data that we get. We're not normalizing it, we're not cleaning it, we're not processing it, except to make sure that patient identities are not revealed. There are tools and services in the research environment. It's available only via virtual desktop infrastructure. And the researchers come in. There are actually a lot of people working in this area very have a, a considerable appetite for the data and would really like to get involved. He's not one of them. Um, that's, um, that's Alan Turing, in fact. But there's another initiative in the UK is the Alan Turing Institute, which is um, not aimed exclusively at uh, life sciences. In fact, quite not. But, but you can see how a lot of bringing the computer scientists to bear on this may add, I mean, or data scientists, so bringing the statisticians and the computer scientists, an interdisciplinary approach to this research at scale is very important. Now, the infrastructure, people like to say, well, wh where is it really? Uh, Biosample Center, so we have a, a national biorepository, uh, which is in the middle of England. We have a sequencing center somewhere, somewhere over in East Anglia. Oh, it's, in, it's near Cambridge, that other university. Excellent place for bioinformatics research. That's on the Hingston campus with the um, Sanger, it's a fantastic center of expertise. The data center, see we don't send the data then, we don't send the data, the data center is uh, somewhere in the English countryside, uh, in a nuclear proof bunker, surrounded by armed guards. Now that's, it's good, it's good. Uh, you really wouldn't want physical security. And you say, look, it's not about physical security. Well, well, there is a physical security aspect to making sure your data is OK, because you can do everything you want in software. But if somebody can actually walk up to the machines, that's problematic. People to walk up to these machines, this is also where our, um, there are other government agencies that have data there um, who are very protective of it. It, it's, you can find it, <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend hiking up, okay? It's got good, but that's, that's important. I'll come to that in a moment. So the data acquisition piece, you could kind of make this up yourself. You, you're all, you, you've got experience in this area. What do you need? Clinical and laboratory data. It's, it's, a, it's almost a, a list of things. What am I going to need? Let's, let's put them in the rucksack. We're going to need registration. We're going to need consent. This is all done with fully informed consent from each of the participants, and they can withdraw it at any time. Clinical and laboratory data, clinically reviewed, not just stuff that has been extracted from the clinical environment. This is stuff that has been eyeballed by the clinicians. They understand this is an accurate record of the diagnosis, treatment, outcomes for a cancer patient. Secondary data from clinical audits and national reporting data sets. And finally, finally, we mentioned LabKey. Of course, we need, all this data needs to be put together. How are we going to do this? We're going to use an instance of LabKey server. There'll also be patient reported data. We'll come to that um, in the future. The research environment, a separate data center, has to be separated. Uh, you know, software can give you a lot of protection. LabKey. Of course, you, you'd be quite happy in the abstract using LabKey to hold the patient identifiable data and the research data. It's got the security that would allow you to do that. However, in terms of the reassurances people need, we need physical separation. Actual physical separation. It's 2015, but we still need it. Uh, so <laughs> a second instance of LabKey server will exist in the research side. Private cloud, virtual desktop infrastructure, no cutting and pasting, 
no direct uploads or downloads. Everything goes through an airlock system. There's a challenge in that too. Progress, got 11 genomic medicine centers kicked off. There are two more coming up. So these are institutions like University College London hospitals. Um, uh, Guys in St. Thomas's, King's, London, Cambridge. But it's not just Cambridge, it's Cambridge and partner hospitals. Birmingham and partner hospitals. We're going to have complete geographical coverage of England. It's a lot of hospitals. A lot of clinical context to consider in terms of the data integration. Uh, we're up to 5,000 whole genome sequences. So um, if we were a floppy disk, for those of you who are old enough, we'd be 5% formatted. But there's a huge lag here when you're building new capability because if you, give, you can give people the contracts, but they've got to hire people. They've got to hire project managers. They've got to commission work in terms of developing infrastructure. They've got to go and find out how they're going to recruit people. They need to prepare materials. They, you know, it doesn't suddenly you give out a contract for a genomic medicine center and tomorrow you have an instant steady state flow of participants. 125 rare diseases, five cancers, one pathogen. Ask me afterwards about pathogens. Uh, Pathogens are great for whole genome sequencing. Careful how you say these. I inadvertently said, we love pathogens at one point. It was recorded and put on the web. Um, of course, we don't love pathogens. But the economic benefit of doing whole genome sequencing and subsequent analysis for pathogens is, is considerable. Four tool providers, 10 pharma companies, now two more have joined. 2,500 researchers. Mm, that's a bit worrying, if you're interested in providing informatics infrastructure, 2,500 researchers, 2,500 individuals who may or may not be in the habit of working constructively and collaboratively together because, of course, the incentives for the research community are not always about, can you all get together and share what you're doing? It's not just, you know, David Cameron didn't fund this himself, although he has had a very strong personal interest. The contributions coming from across the board, we have the NIHR Biomedical Research Centers. So that's the National Institute for Health Research. It's a one billion annual spend on, um, one billion pounds, annual spend on um, biomedical translational research, health research in the UK. The Bioresource for Rare Diseases. The Health Informatics Collaborative which is getting comparable, semantically consistent clinical data from across five large university hospital partnerships, comprehensive BRCs, Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, Imperial, and guys in St. Thomas's. The Medical Research Council, NHS England. NHS England, absolutely key here. Public Health England, Cancer Research UK, Wellcome Trust. It's about bringing everybody together. If you're going to do this, You've got to negotiate the politics. You've got to get people on side. You've got to make it work for everyone if you're going to do it as a national or international initiative. It's a lot of work. Challenges, which is where you know, I could do some, I could have asked you to imagine these. Um, part of the funding for this came from the Medical Research Council in the UK, it came through them. And the chief scientist, and the Chief Technology Officer for Genomics England had to write an app, because they can't just give you the money. You, you have to write a jolly large grant application. Um, and you have to explain exactly what you're going to do, why you need it all. So again, it comes back to academics. We like doing stuff and then reporting on it. Saying in great detail what you're going to do in advance and making lots of claims about it, is, we can do it. Academics can get grant funding, but you know, we have to really steel ourselves and push ourselves forward to do it. The, this was an extreme example of that. So uh, we were going to be interviewed, and we, we walked into the room. And it's about, about this number of people. For those of you who are not in the room, there's, you know, I guess 80 people in this room, 60 people in this room. I know, I'm not going to count you. But a whole room full of people. And we come in and we sit down. And uh, we're asked a bunch of questions. And the end, sort of a friendly final question, saying it's a very brave initiative, very big initiative, complicated, a lot of complications, lots of risks. So, um, so tell me, what's keeping you awake at night? And I 
I, as, as a computer scientist, as a, a very large informatics component to the project, I was getting ready to answer. I was going to say, data integrity, uh, loss of data integrity, loss of data, uh, security issues. Um, because I, I, you, can you imagine how it would feel if people had spent 300 million collecting data and you walk in one morning and you know, one of your team says, we've got nothing but the top level directories. You know, that <laughs> wouldn't be great. Fortunately, this yammering computer scientist was kept in his seat by the proper doctor in the room, Professor Mark Caulfield, who, who stood up and said, losing the trust of the great British public which is absolutely right. You're only going to succeed. We can expand on that by saying it's not just the great British public you need the trust of. But if people aren't willing to engage, to participate, to consent, to provide the sample, to provide the data, and they're happy to have you use it, and the consent's board, because if you're going to develop new diagnostics, new therapeutics, you're going to need to engage the commercial organizations that do that. So this is not stuff that's only shown to AN academic who you know, may or may not share it with anybody else. This has to be, you know, and big pharma is not necessarily a, a very positive term in some ways, but actually these are the people who develop the drugs. If you want something done, you need to engage the industry that does it at scale. Commercial entities involved in NHS patient data. A lot of sensitivities around that. You can really see how somebody, it wouldn't take a huge sea change for people to have a crisis of confidence in what we were doing. Trust is everything, underpins everything that we're doing. It's not just the trust of the patients, it's also the clinicians and the researchers. I mentioned the research environment. If you're a researcher, you like doing things your way, using your tools and your team. Somebody says, you've now got to go and do this on somebody else's computers, in somebody else's environment, where you don't even get to automatically upload all the data that you want, and you can't cut and paste. Mm. It's going to be, oh, <laughs> and you have to work with all the other researchers in this domain. It's quite... Uh, the other challenge, of course, is that we're trying to transform the clinical informatics because we really want that high-resolution patient participant data. And we're trying to transform the research informatics to make more of the research reusable. Andy Grove, Intel, lovely talks about reducing the turn time in cancer research. It's no good. I, I you know, it was... Um, there's a lovely story of how there were three labs in the world working on this particular cancer. If you look for the um, YouTube videos of the SAGE Commons Congress meetings, you can actually see this firsthand. But talking about the charity spending its money, actually sending a team from one to the other, just passing on what this institute has discovered, letting the other one know about it without waiting for the publication cycle. Just getting them to tell each other what they were doing what insights they had. Of course, you've got to do that in a controlled way. You've got to realize that you know, these people have to keep their, their jobs, their tenure, their, their funding. You can't simply say, hey, you've got some insights. Go and give them to everybody else. Really got to try and change this, this culture. It's very complicated. You don't have to change everything in every domain, but it touches on every domain. And you have to change a little everywhere. Now. I would commend, if you wanted a flavor of the, the, the 100,000 Genomes Project and the spirit thereof, um, that you know, if you Google for Genomics England YouTube, you'll find that you know, we're, we're trying to get this bit across the mission. And you'll see that there's a little video that explains to prospective participants, what does Genomics England do with your data? Viv and I wrote the script, but Viv has a much better voice than I do. And therefore, she narrates it. Nothing without your consent. You can withdraw at any time. And of course, you know, that's interesting. And you have a lovely, well, not lovely, a very accurate story about how the data moves from hospitals to the Genomics England data center, how it comes from Illumina. 
fact that some of this data is quite large. I know people talk about big data. Actually, we've, we've overcome them, but we did have some bandwidth problems moving the whole genome sequences around, as you would think. It's all done securely. Um, those are not the actual people on duty at the data center, and that's not the actual data center. But it's a serious point. There's a promise that we're making, that trust. It's very easily lost. You can't, you can't mess about with that. This really is secure management of data. What will the scientists do? And of course, those of you, anybody here work in information security? Hmm. Yeah, you couldn't possibly tell me, I suppose. I don't know. But it's, um, of course, you know, I'm not, the scientists, they're the people who do the work. But of course, there's a lot of risk there. I'm not saying there are any bad scientists. I'm sure there are no bad scientists in the world. But, you know, inadvertent actions, people in a hurry to get to that research goal might compromise some aspect of the infrastructure. So you really have to help these guys. They are, of course, there to understand which difference is important, come up with the best treatment, use current medicines better, come up with new drugs, new diagnostics. Uh, but they'll need to explain what they're doing in advance. They'll need to get it approved. And they'll be, um, they'll be monitored while they're doing it. Scientists in universities, scientists in industry, scientists in hospitals. Not marketing companies or insurance uh, companies, really. Um, they're not welcome. And uh, they, they perform a valuable social role, but you want to keep these things separate because you want to retain the trust, the confidence of those who are participating. So your data makes a difference. The, um, yeah, have a look at that video on YouTube. Uh, try not to look at the other videos on YouTube that you find randomly. Look at the good ones that come from Genomics England. But you'll appreciate that if you're talking about genetics, genomes, detailed patient information, big data, and a government, oh, and big pharma, whichever, whichever you're more paranoid about, that this might cause some people to put together little YouTube videos about how this is somehow the end of times, or, you know, this is all part of the the vaccinators coming to get us, or whatever. You, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Some of them are quite entertaining, actually. I'm not, you know, not belittling or ridiculing these people, because I think you do that at your peril, particularly if they find out where you live. But it's, <laughs> yeah, it'll give you a sense of the fact that you have to tread carefully here. Everyone's got to be professional, focused, and earn and maintain that trust. Now, thanks. The Genomics England team, Sir John Chisholm, who's the executive chair, has done a fantastic job of negotiating some of the politics. You can see there are so many ways that some other organization could say, oh, we should be doing this, or you shouldn't be doing that. Interfere. Strong leadership. Mark Caulfield, as an informatics program, you can't have in this space, you really want a medic in charge. Vivian Parry, a better communicator than I am. Ed Stafford, Director of Informatics, who actually is at the back of the room and will be answering all of your questions later. And of course, LabKey. You know, the, the whole point of this is work hard. Of course, we're all very hard workers. Work fast. We're on a timeline here because, you know, <laughs> all of these things, if you really want to, to you've got, it requires momentum, requires speed, requires timely delivery, you know. You, you don't want to be going slowly with this. You want to get the 100,000 genomes done, get the virtuous circle of scientific progress, NHS transformation, up and going, up and running. Work hard, work fast, but also get help. Easily forgotten, but probably the most important part of that saying. So um, we've got some help. We're very pleased about that. Um, thanks to LabKey, and enjoy the rest of the conference. I got confused about the timing. I don't know whether I've now got time for Q&A or whether I've just eaten up the Q&A. There's a yellow light in front of me, and I forgot its semantics. We've got time for a few questions. Yeah.
very quick one. Why, why do you know them in England and not do you know them in the UK? <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you're excluding what, 20% of the population? No, of course, you know, we're, we're all in this together. Um, so, no, the, so the way that, I mean, you, you, you're from Canada, sir, aren't you now? I can identify your, your accent is English. But, you know, there's a certain amount of devolved power and responsibility. Some things are, are, you know, I wouldn't say England is local, but, you know, there are responsibilities given for the administration of the health service, and this is driven by the health service in the end. And it's NHS England who have driven it. So it's, if you like, it's English money. Now, of course, you know, there's no, you know, not that sort of nationalism going on. So, of course, we would like, I'm actually not English, I'm Welsh. Uh, we, we would like the Welsh. I won't talk to you about the Welsh. Anyway, <laughs> moving swiftly on. And the Scots, you know, they're, they're, but again, this needs to be, everybody needs to make their own mind up to participate. I, I, and, and indeed, that is what's happening. Because you want the numbers. There's no sense in doing this you know, too locally. And in fact, we're reaching out globally as well for memorandum of understanding with um, British Columbia, um, Genomics British Columbia. And also, I believe there's one in the works. Ed's more up to date on this than I am. But with Australia, you know, looking at saying, you know, if you're going to, particularly for the rare disease, you might only have five people in the country with this. You know, don't, don't you know, actually reach out and say, well, what have you discovered about the three sufferers in your country? What can we do? And in fact, this comes back to the patients and their families. They're very keen for you to do that in general. And, and it's, you can see this, it comes back to this secure environment, private cloud. You know, you can see open data people say, well, you know, we're very well intentioned. It's very good in some circumstances, but shouldn't you just release this data? No, because it's kind of sensitive, it's kind of personal, it's kind of important. And you shouldn't be forcing these patients to sort of go the, the social networking route. You should provide a working, you know, clinically mediated environment where you can get the experts involved and, and make this data, make the data sharing that you want happen across international boundaries so that you can drive new discovery and come up with better treatments and patient benefit while not, th you know, just banging the data on the web and bringing all the harm that could come to the individuals as well. So it's, you know, this has to be, you know, you reach out to, to Wales, or in Northern Ireland, but you know, beyond the UK as well. It's Genomics England because England paid for it in the first instance. But that's the only reason. It's not, you know, anything more parochial than that. Oh, just as well. I didn't leave any longer for questions then, really, isn't it? Okay, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Jim.